Hello and welcome to the 13 on your side Great Lakes Shipwreck Special. I'm Nate Belt and over the next half hour we're going to share nine stories of shipwreck discoveries on the Great Lakes. The former 13 on your side reporter and host of our Michigan Life, Brent Ashcroft, will share these amazing stories of ships long lost to the Great Lakes. We kick off the special with a story about what is arguably the most famous of these shipwrecks, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. Almost 50 years ago, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. All 29 crew members aboard lost their lives in the wreck. It was the largest ship to ever sink in the Great Lakes, and its resting place is now 530 feet below the lake surface, allowing only experienced divers with expensive submersible vehicles to visit her. Brent Ashcroft spoke with someone who not only has dove the Fitzgerald wreck site, but saw something at the bottom that still haunts him to this day. The gales of November, they're no joke. You get a beautiful day like today, and then it snaps into a cold front that, you know, sends it sub-zero. Documentarian Rick Mixter knows this to be fact. After 200 feet, no more sunlight can penetrate through Lake Superior. Because he's one of the few. It ripped our hearts out. To have seen it up close and personal. You've seen pictures of the Fitzgerald, but had no idea how intact it would be. The bow section looks like it could still sail, you know, and as you went through and saw the damage, it was very sobering, beat up and buried into the mud where that ship came down with such force into what looks like an underwater hill or, or you know, a half mountain, if you will. Mixter traveled 530 feet to the bottom to investigate. We took a two-person submersible called the Delta. The Great Lakes most famous graveyard. I saw everything from the letters of the Fitzgerald to the pilot house, a blanket hanging out of the window, um, phones. It hit the bottom with such force that it ripped the spar deck, the deck that has the hatches, away from the hull. So there's a massive gap that's right inside um, the, the top going towards the uh, port side of the ship. It, that's from the, the massive momentum of 26,000 tons of taconite pushing forward when it hit the bottom. And around the bow section, you can see the prow of the ship in its thick, thick steel bent over 90 degrees from that collision with the bottom. He also saw something. Discovered the first missing crewman. Unexpected. They went so close that they recorded the entire face, the body, and these mysterious blocks that were on the body that looked like bricks. But later on, we figured out that was a court life vest. His hour and a half with the fits is burned into his brain. We couldn't believe it. Forever. I wish, really wish I could go back someday. A shipwreck long sought after by Great Lakes wreck hunters was finally discovered in Lake Michigan. In late July of 2020, a pair of men found the final resting place of the Pierre Marquette 18 Railroad Car Ferry, which plunged to the bottom of the lake in 1910. Brent Ashcroft talked to the wreck hunters and gives us a fascinating glimpse of that wreck site. Everybody likes efficiency. This one was one of the mysteries uh, of Lake Michigan's. Don't dawdle. Surprisingly enough, it didn't set the record for us. Get it done. The quickest we've, we've ever found one is 45 minutes. Minnesota shipwreck hunters Ken Merriman and Jerry Eliason Occasionally the stars are aligned, aligned just right. Found one of Lake Michigan's most sought after shipwrecks. It is one of the bigger ones. The first day they looked for it. Historic ship. The Pier Marquette 18 car ferry, which mysteriously sank in 1910. We each put an X on the chart where we thought it was, I won that bet. In late July, the pair ventured into Lake Michigan, 25 miles east of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. It's not quite in Michigan. It's about as middle of the lake, or almost as middle of the lake as you can be. 10 hours into their search. And it showed up as just a small, bright spot. Her final resting place. When we made a pass over top of it with our down scan, it drew a perfect picture of a shipwreck. Revealed itself. It's always a rush. Not diveable at 500 feet beneath the surface. And it is really neat being able to be the first to see this thing in, in 110 years. They dropped a camera down and saw the ship had speared into the bottom. Sitting at about a 30 to 40 degree angle. There were more revelations. How the wheelhouse, cabin under the wheelhouse, lifted off and spun around and then fell back onto the stern the smoking gun that led to the identification. And the feature that we were seeing are the 
the lifeboat cradles. They match perfectly to the pictures. There's uh, cradles that the lifeboat sat, three on each side. On September 9, 1910, the Pier Marquette 18 left Ludington, Michigan for Milwaukee, carrying 29 railroad cars and 62 people. She sank mid-voyage taking 29 lives with her. There's rumors that there were two stowaways on board. They may have contributed to the sinking by not having the portholes closed where they were hiding out. The truth behind why she sank may never be known. Sometimes the history works and sometimes it doesn't. For these maritime enthusiasts, one of the last big steel ships to be found. This discovery is another box checked on their shipwreck bucket list. We're kind of ready to go off and look, look for the next one. The COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns may have paused shipwreck explorers from searching for lost ships, but Mother Nature provided an opportunity that couldn't be passed up. This next story shares how a hiker learned how to identify and catalog a shipwreck all while social distancing. When it comes to lost vessels on the Great Lakes, there is one certainty. They'll be found when they want to be found. How the remains of a recently discovered shipwreck were identified in quarantine in our Michigan life. Mother Nature doesn't know or care about coronavirus. She does what she wants, when she wants. The storm was over the weekend what she did April 19th on the Garden Peninsula south of Manistique, Michigan, churned up this, which is really not an area we would ever be surveying, bones that had been buried for 117 years. It was pretty awesome. The wreck was discovered by an anonymous beachcomber whose curiosity led to an investigation by Craig Rich of the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association. And we normally would have uh, all hopped in the truck and run up there. But the pandemic wouldn't let them. We're not supposed to be that close to each other right now. Quarantine wasn't going to stop this wreck from being identified. This uh, gentleman uh, said that he would be willing to go out there and take some measurements. The beachcomber was coached how to properly investigate the wreck site. He's got his uh, tape measure uh, laying on the sand. He took several pictures. He measured out 15 feet in one direction and saw something sticking out of the sand like a large pole. Another 20 feet in the other direction, he was able to uh, pound the stake down into the sand and actually find more structure. For an amateur, he did a really thorough job of measuring and getting us the information we needed to positively identify the ship. So what is it? The R. Canters, a schooner that ran aground during a storm in 1903. Lost to history, covered by the sand for 117 years until this week. Suddenly, there it is. The ship was named after its owner, Rokas Canters. A very prominent citizen. Who happened to be the mayor of Holland, Michigan in the late 1800s. After being exposed for just three days. If people do venture up to this area, it may not be there to see. The wreck site is already being reclaimed by the shifting sands along the shoreline. But thanks to an observant beachcomber. That's the only one we've ever done without, uh, you know, going to take a look at it. A piece of Michigan maritime history is no longer a mystery. I was really glad that we were able to identify the ship, tell the story. A typical honeymoon doesn't usually mean diving in the Straits of Mackinac looking for lost ships, but this couple is anything but typical. Meet the couple that celebrated their love at the bottom of the Great Lakes. There's over 6,000 shipwrecks here in the Great Lakes. You can cross two more off the undiscovered list thanks to a South Haven couple's honeymoon wreck hunt. Some want their wedding vows to be traditional. My wife and I got married uh, during COVID. I promise to love, honor, and obey. It's how we find our happy place. In sickness and in shipwrecks. So many of our locals aren't even aware they're here until death do us part. We have shipwrecks all over out here. Statewide restrictions didn't force Kevin and Amy Ailes to social distance from shipwrecks. We opted rather than a lot of travel. To spend your first days married, bobbing in a boat. I'm a little bit um, obsessed with shipwrecks. Going all Indiana Jones. I put uh, investigating this Mackinac Island wreck uh, on, on our list. Every new bride's honeymoon dream, right, Amy? <laughs>
The couple hoped to find and identify two wrecks, the Dolphin, a schooner that sank in 1869, and the Peshtigo, a freighter that met the same fate in 1908. An article was published which had an account from 1970 of the, the diver who actually was first on the shipwreck. And he had measurements of the shipwreck with modern research techniques and locating the damage on the, on the vessel. I was able to decide that this was indeed the dolphin. In just 55 feet of water. Lots of identifiable features. Near Mackinac Island. That's the collision hole from when this got hit. The newlyweds weren't done. We came across a report from 1992 that the bow of a boat had been seen in the harbor and was very vague about where it was. Kevin was certain it was the remains of the Peshtigo. Well, if we're going to investigate one, we're going to investigate the other. Side scan sonar discovered. We were able to find a sizable bump on the bottom. This. The Peshtigo originally was 198 feet long. The biggest piece of it today measures about 55 feet long. Every time you take Shepler's Ferry into Mackinac Island, you go right over the Peshtigo wreckage. Some people's marriages, unfortunately, end up. This is great Midwest history. Wrecked. One of the many highlights of my honeymoon. Kevin and Amy started out wrecked. It sure is. So the only way you two can live happily ever after is if it stays wrecked? I better not answer that one. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> On November 11, 1863, just 17 months before the end of the Civil War, a Great Lakes steamship named Water Witch was braving the perils of Lake Huron during a fierce storm. She'd founder and sink 230 feet to the bottom, taking 20 souls with her. Shipwreck hunters have been searching for its final resting place for more than half a century. That search is now over, and one of Lake Huron's holy grails is crossed off the list. It's a game. Target certain areas where you think there's a higher probability of finding it. David Trotter is its Tom Brady. We are in the fourth quarter of discovering and exploring shipwrecks. Knows how to win. And I always had in the back of my mind, we may have missed it. Because he's the best in the biz. <laughs> you know, you keep looking for trouble, you might find us. Finding is where he rarely fumbles. I had known of the loss of the water witch since the uh, middle 70s. Built in 1862. Wooden steamer, 165 feet long. With a radical design. A walking beam engine. Carried flour. Silver ore and copper ingots. She was uh, downbound. Saginaw Bay. Which is one of the most vicious areas for navigation and for uh, shipwrecks. Succumbed to a storm. It was just days later they began to see debris from the wreck had characteristics that were identical to what would be the water witch. All hands lost. June 2021. You begin to map out areas to search. Trotter and his crew we got it. It's coming we right there. Our first end goal. Now that's a really nice look at it, isn't it? And I can tell you right now, that's our ship. The question is, what, what have you found? Well, that's yet to be determined most times. In this instance, that was certainly the case. As we grappled into the shipwreck, and the diver suited up and descended. Got to get eyes on it. The visibility was sufficient to allow a kind of an overview of the ship as you settle down onto it. It's definitely an ancient vessel. Swimming down the deck, you come to open cargo hatches that we dropped down into and actually found some grain, which is another identification about the, the, what this vessel was carrying. We move out into the front of the bow, and both of those wooden stock anchors are still in place, which told us that they had no chance to uh, use those in an effort to uh, stave off the tragedy. After close investigation and looking at the, the remains of that site, it was pretty apparent that we had the mechanical application for the walking beam engine. Touchdown. We could finally conclude that we had found the water witch. It may be the fourth quarter for Great Lakes shipwreck discoveries. It was on the top of my list. But David Trotter continues to move the ball. We continue to search and continue to chew up territory. And he doesn't plan to take a knee. Next year, uh, we'll see. There's a lot of water out there. <laughs>
A window into the past opened along the Lake Michigan shoreline just south of the White Lake Channel in Muskegon. Rough waves calved off a giant section of a dune revealing the remains of a shipwreck from the 1800s. It's only been exposed two known times before 1942 and again in 1974. Then the wind waves and shifting sands buried it. For decades, the wreck was identified as the L.C. Woodruff, a schooner that foundered near the White Lake Channel in 1878. Brent Ascroft shows us the shipwreck identification process. Mother Nature is a wild woman. Stiff winds and huge waves are reshaping Lake Michigan's shoreline. Every now and again, she uh, pulls pieces of the beach away, exposes what might be there. A former dune is now a bluff, revealing what's been hiding under it. Give us a brief connection with our historic past. The spine and ribs of a ship. The same storms that a uh, century ago um, brought these ships to their final end near shore are the same storms that are today eroding away at the sand. When the wreckage was last exposed in 1974, a lighthouse keeper made the discovery. He identified it as the L.C. Woodruff. That was the big schooner. He even recovered this piece of the bow stem from that wreckage. Nobody questioned that it wasn't the Woodruff. We learned from historical news accounts that six different schooners met their fate uh, near the White Lake Channel. Until now. The channel wasn't always right here. The channel was three quarters of a mile north. That fact ruled out three of the wrecks. So we're left with uh, three possibilities. One is a small schooner, uh, named the Madison, the other is a medium schooner named the Contest, and the third is a schooner named the L.C. Woodruff, and that was 175 feet long. Only one way to find out. Get down there, examine the remains. Assess the condition of the wreck and get as much information as we can to uh, try and get a good identification of it. The surf churn. This isn't a whole ship, do you think? While Valerie Van Heest. Did you want the dimensions of the of the Kielsen. And Eric Harmsen measured, dug, okay. then documented. So if this were, say, 46 to 66, and this was a 125-foot ship, do you feel like this is in the right place for a ship that big? It feels right. They found something. So we see a metal fitting here that would have been the pivot point for the centerboard trunk. This centerboard starting at about 50 feet into the ship. The centerboard is generally 10 or 12 feet long. We're probably looking at this as being about the middle. And then we know there's more of the ship buried. As gawkers gathered, okay. their investigation continued. Nine, nine four. Ultimately leading to. We're starting to draw some conclusions and identification. We can right away rule out that this was the smaller ship Madison. There's not a whole boat here. It's the Madison was only the length of what we're seeing here. Two possibilities remain. For this to be the L.C. Woodruff, it would have to have been a ship three times as long as the wreckage here. Just doesn't seem like it could be. It's starting to seem like this is probably the contest. Um, a ship lost in 1882. The contest sailed the Great Lakes and was used in the grain and lumber trade. And here it is all these years later. Mother Nature is a wild woman. Her fury gave us this gift. It could be covered up again quite soon. But it reappeared long enough to set the record straight. Positive uh, identification here is the contest. And allow people to see a real time capsule to the past. We don't know if it'll be gone next week, and we don't know if it'll reappear again in the future. A shipwreck from the 1800s, considered to be one of the holy grails by Great Lakes explorers, was discovered almost 135 years later. Watch as an expedition dives to uncover a ship that has long been sought by explorers on the Great Lakes. There are many Great Lakes shipwrecks that are considered to be holy grails by hunters. We're on board with a group of explorers who believe they found one that sank in the 1800s. Somewhere off Sleeping Bear Point, 
hidden within the uneven underwater topography that makes up the Manitou Passage. The quickest route up to the Mackinac Straits was in between the islands. Rests a wreck. It's a smaller version of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Its final resting place has been a Great Lakes mystery for more than a century. People have looked for it before. Ross Richardson is one of them. His side scan sonar captured this image. I thought, okay, this could be that vessel. Only one way to know for sure. Get back out there. Go to the bottom. Get eyes on it. With the shoreline behind, four footers in front. We can do this. This risky expedition begins. I'm excited to see what it is. I mean, we've been looking at the pictures and talking about it for six months or longer. After a 30 minute ride. We are there. It's right underneath us. The wait is almost over. Deploy the grapple. While the anchor drops. We're gonna wanna let it all out. Yeah, that's what I thought. And hooks onto the wreck. We'll swing around with our bow into it and there'll be enough slack that'll cushion our ride a little bit. Diver Steve Weimer gears up for his trip of more than 200 feet. All right, y'all set? I need a mask. Beneath the surface. He starts his slow descent to whatever awaits. Oh, I see his bubble. Top side. A regalus with tales of what he saw down there. Anticipation. I think it's gonna be pretty cool. One of probably three different vessels, so we'll see. It's the one we think it is, or a surprise. Almost an hour later, Steve pops up. Okay. And makes his way to the back of the boat. Mass, our land, all over is a big windlass on the bow. The starboard side's kind of intact, but the port side is kind of peeled away and leaning. There is a big boiler type thing. From what I could see, the stern is all collapsed and kind of buried, broken up. Could you make out a cargo of any kind? No, I don't, if there was, there wasn't. Like the, the deck was like collapsed. But there had to have been one, two, three, four hatches, big beams, big masts. There was one that was partially sticking up and was broke off. Is there a break in the hull? Back on land. The bow itself is on a 45 degree angle. But armed with maps, models, and Steve's memory. It's got to be bigger than a 130 foot schooner. It is definitely okay. bigger than that. Okay, so that, that narrows it down a lot. Their debrief intensifies. It's sounding more and more like the Lord and it's just the back end impaled leading to an identification, the wreck they thought it was. The Jarvis Lord. The Jarvis Lord was a 193 foot freighter that sprung a leak and sank in 1885. Luckily, all crew members survived. That is the first time anybody's seen this since the 1800s. Lake Michigan still has many unidentified shipwrecks sprawled across its sandy floor. I would like to find as many as possible. The Jarvis Lord is no longer one of them. I've spent some time out there trying to find this. David Trotter has been looking for shipwrecks for decades and one in particular has eluded him until it finally didn't. Trotter always says that a shipwreck will be found when it wants to be found, and that was especially true One when Trotter discovered certain. something while looking for an She's entirely different there. wreck. In the deep. A shipwreck hunting is uh, looking at mysteries to be solved. Somewhere. There's no guarantee that you will find what you're looking for. David Trotter knows the wreck game well. I've run it for 40 years. He's found many, but one that's eluded him. A shipwreck will be found when it wants to be found. <laughs> Has always been considered one of the undiscovered holy grails. We had her on our list 30 years ago. Of the Great Lakes. It is the last of the missing whalebacks. September 21st, 1924. The SS Clifton, a 308 foot long freighter, left Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Destination? To deliver the aggregate to a uh, facility in Detroit. She never arrived. The Clifton was last seen heading south, having made the turn to go down Lake Huron. And somewhere about mid-lake, there was a horrific storm that developed. An intense gale battered the Clifton. 
causing her to founder. When she did not arrive, they began to search for her. Debris and human remains were scattered uh, all over the lake. The ship was lost with all hands. She's one of those great unsolved mysteries that how did a vessel carrying 27 captain and 26 crew simply disappear in 1924 and never discovered. Wreck hunters have been searching for nearly a century. If you had to look at the top remaining ships to be found in Lake Huron, uh, Clifton would just be about number one. Trotter's quest began in 1987. Lake Huron is 25,000 square miles of surface. Now that means there's an awful lot of water out there to go looking for a given ship that was a little bit over 300 feet long. Three decades later, his searches have only led him to where the Clifton wasn't. I figured I'd missed it. Well, what if I didn't miss it? In early fall of 2016, our last day of survey. You're on the bottom now. Trotter and his team were working the lake. We had another target. They decided to investigate. When the divers surfaced, well back down there, Dave. They shared. You got to be kidding! What they oh, saw. Oh, no, if you're telling me that's a whale back, that could be the Clifton. Uh, uh, an awesome dive. What a discovery! Holy mackerel! This is unbelievable. Discovered and identified. My God, we finally found the Clifton. Summer 2017. Trotter's team made nine expeditions to more fully explore this site. I'm trying to learn exactly what happened that put her over 100 miles away from the last sighting. Okay, four out of five in the water. During their slow descent to the deep, the historic vessel came into view. She's turned over heavily on her port side, a little more than 45 degrees. And the divers, with great uh, care and skill, managed to weave through parts of the engine room and into other parts of the ship where pipes are hanging, tremendous amount of, of uh, debris and material. As we worked back toward the stern section, we came across the turrets the spilled open cargo hatches that had gravel or aggregate rolled out onto the floor of Lake Huron. The part of the rudder that was very interesting to us is that it was continued to be straight forward. We realized that she had uh, torpedoed toward the bottom, literally perhaps under power. literally crumpling the first 30 or 40 foot of her bow. This item of significance survived the sinking. The wheel is still attached today to the Clifton, hanging kind of uh, just delicately just a couple feet off the floor of Lake Huron. Back at the surface. Nobody's been where you've been since 1924 there. Celebration. That was a cool wreck. Great piece of history, isn't it? Trotter is far from finished with the Clifton. More expeditions are in store. Historical records will uh, validate uh, much of the information we have pulled up and, prov and will provide to uh, historians regarding the site. What is finished? Nice looking event down there. The near century long search. It's one of the last great mysteries on the lakes and we've managed to solve it. One of the first ships built in Ottawa County has been discovered in Lake Michigan. A two-masted schooner that sank during a storm in 1873 has at long last been found resting at the lake's bottom near South Haven. Brent Ashcroft takes us to the wreck site to discover the vessel's name, who found her, and what that discovery means for Michigan maritime history. This particular wreck is very deep. It's about 275 feet deep. It's an old wooden vessel. She's located about 15 miles northwest of the South Haven Pier. Last summer, searching for Northwest Flight 2501, we encountered another shipwreck. This will be the 10th shipwreck that we found in the course of looking for the airplane. When this image appeared on sonar. Here's the evidence on the bottom 
all these years later. Explorers from the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association knew they'd hooked a new target. Our technical dive team got down to the wreck and saw a very um, broken up shipwreck. We're seeing the devastation when the deck separated from the hull. The ship would eventually be identified. And the name is Lizzie Throop. One of the first ships built in Ottawa County. 85 feet long, constructed at Mill Point, now Spring Lake, in 1849. It sank in 1873. Two men died in the sinking, four men lived. She foundered in a storm. The deck and the masts floated ashore with the survivors, came ashore at South Haven, and the hull went to the bottom. What we're really seeing underwater is we're seeing a, an incredible history that dates to soon after Michigan was a state. 145 years after her sinking, crossed the Lizzie Throop off the search list. We're still looking for Northwest Flight 2501, the ultimate uh, goal of our expedition, but we're so pleased to be able to have another incredible piece of Michigan's maritime history come to light now because of our efforts. The Great Lakes have claimed many ships and sailors over the centuries, and brave underwater explorers will continue to find these wrecks and tell their tales. You can learn more about each of the stories shared here today on our website, 13onyourside.com. Thank you for joining us.